This week on The Communicators, a look at a decision by the Department of Justice to allow satellite radio companies XM and Sirius to combine. Our guest is telecom and media analyst Blair Levin. Blair Levin joins us, the managing director of Stiefel Nicholas, a research analyst group here in D.C. Mr. Levin, welcome. Thank you. And this week a decision there was made about XM and Sirius. Right. What was done? Well, what the Justice Department decided to do was essentially to do nothing. That is to say, to neither sue the companies to block the proposed merger of XM and Sirius, nor to attach any conditions to that merger. So now the playing field shifts over to the FCC, which also has to approve that merger, and we believe it will. There were several issues when they went to justice about antitrust. What right. specifically, what kind of questions had to be asked, in your opinion, and what kind of questions, or were any answers given as far as uh, those questions? Well, the key questions that the Department of Justice is looking at, whenever they look at a merger, is would this combination of companies tend to cause prices to go up, output to go down, and innovation to go down? And what the Justice Department did was essentially looked at the landscape for satellite radio and said, you know, even though there are only two satellite radio companies, there's a lot of other things going on in the market. We don't think prices are going up. We don't think output will be restricted. And we don't think in innovation will be stifled. A lot of things going on in the market, such as? Well, among the things that they looked at uh, were kind of macro things, such as uh, what, what's the impact of iPods? If people have the ability to bring in 5,000 songs and plug it into their car stereo, what does that do to the ability of the satellite radio companies to to increase pr increase prices? You have cell phone companies like Verizon and AT&T also offering uh, music services uh, over the air. Uh, you have HD radio coming online. So there are a lot of different kinds of things in the market. Um, the, the opponents to the merger said that fundamentally there are only two satellite radio companies. They only compete with each other. Um, and that therefore the merger should be blocked. The Justice Department all, uh, obviously disagreed. But, but there were also some very small things that uh, weren't apparent at first, such as the, uh, the Justice Department said, even though there are only two satellite radio companies, as a practical matter, since both companies have exclusive deals with various car manufacturers, if you go to buy a Toyota, you don't really have a choice. You're going to get the satellite radio uh, provider that Toyota has a deal with, or Honda or GM. So in that sense, allowing a combination wouldn't really affect consumers uh, because they don't compete really against each other today. There was a, that kind of point was made by a columnist here in the Washington Post. Uh, uh, it was Steve Perlstein. Right. And he wrote something along this line with, with the idea of there's a lot of competition in the market. He says that there is no direct competition at the moment satellite radio in the market for commercial-free, multi-format, por portable audio entertainment. None. That's why it's so popular, why there's 14 million subscribers, why it's growing so fast. How do you square with that? Well, look, it's not how I do it. It's how the Department of Justice squares with it. I think what the Department of Justice would say, again, is uh, it all depends on what you mean by competition. And what was really interesting about this transaction, and, and part of the reason I think a lot of analysts got it wrong, a lot of folks said the Justice Department won't, won't um, uh, approve this deal, is that it, it all depends on what you think about competition. And if you see competition as only existing where you have absolutely identical kinds of products uh, competing against each other, then you would clearly say there's no competition, let it go. But when they actually did the studies and they did the consumer behaviors and there's millions of dollars of economic studies having been filed at mm -hmm. the Department of Justice, things like the iPod, which is not a symmetrical form of competition, it's a different kind of service. Things like radio itself, which is still listened to, I mean, yes, there are 14 million satellite radio subscribers, but every day 225 million or more Americans listen to free over-the-air radio. When you look at those things and you see the dynamic in the market, the Justice Department simply disagrees with Mr. Perlstein and says there is a market dynamic. You know, there was one key fact, I think, that uh, was, was important to the Justice Department, Five years, or actually it's been more, I guess now, almost almost seven years of offering a service, uh, two different companies. They're both losing a lot of money, right? Uh, XM has lost more than $600 million last year. Sirius lost an order of magnitude $500 million. There's only been one price increase. Now, that's very unusual behavior. If you think there's no competition, if you think the market is solely composed of XM and Sirius, why would you go that many years, lose that much money, 
and not raise prices more. And I, what I think the Justice Department decided was that the reason is is because consumers do have choices. This is not a must-have product if you want to have entertainment in your car. Uh, there are other choices. So as far as the commissioners on the FCC looking at it, is it concerned that one person is going to hold these, uh, these two companies if they are allowed to merge, that one person will oversee that? Well, I think when the, when the FCC looks at it, they look at a different standard um, than the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice is only about competition. Right. The FCC is about competition, but it is also broader. It includes what's called the public interest. So I think they're going to look at a variety of different factors, and they're going to try to, uh, they'll, they'll probably attach some conditions to address those concerns, and each of the con commissioners would have different concerns. Conditions such as? Well, for example, Chairman Martin uh, very much uh, wants to accomplish a couple of things. First of all, I think he thinks that a, a so-called a la carte structure would be better than the current structure, under the current structure with satellite radio. Both companies essentially have a big list of of, of offerings, more than 100 channels, some are commercial free, some aren't, a uh, variety of different formats, and you, you char they charge about $12.95. What Martin wants to do is have the uh, surviving company um, have a kind of thinner basic tier. Instead of 100 channels, maybe it's 30 or 40 or something. Charge less money, maybe $6.95. And then all the other channels be offered on an a la carte basis, so you pay a quarter or, what, or 50 cents or whatever it is for each additional channel that you want. His view is people shouldn't have to pay so much money for so much product they don't want. So that's going to be a major concern of his. Another concern I think will be indecency. I don't think the FCC is going to regulate indecency um, on satellite radio the way they do on free over the air radio. And indeed I think there would be some serious constitutional problems if they did. However, I can see the FCC requiring that on that skinnier tier, that basic tier that everybody has to buy, that there's no uh, programming that people would regard as being indecent. And those two stem to issues, if you look at the cable industry, uh, because, uh, and aren't there concerns because people pay for something that uh, more regulation, specifically in, in indecency's case, how can they uh, do that if you're willing to pay for a service? Exactly. I, I, what I think the Supreme Court would say is if you're paying for that service, you're making a choice. But if you're paying for a service where in order to get 40 channels that are uh, what we might think of as just decent, but you then have to take five or six that are indecent, it presents a different problem. But clearly on an a la carte basis, um, the, the constitutional issues would prohibit the FCC from uh, invoking that kind of indecency regulation. But there are a number of other conditions that have been proposed. Uh, for example, uh, some folks want to make sure there's a set aside for public interest programming. Uh, some folks want to make sure that there's um, an opportunity for other kinds of devices to offer the, 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 to sell other devices to sell the service. Some folks want to essentially have the company set aside a certain percentage of the spectrum for programming that comes from a third-party source. So there'll be a debate over the next um, you know, several weeks to several months at the FCC on these issues. On the public interest, would it be like public access channels on, on cable or, or something along that line where someone pays to do community broadcasting or something along those exactly lines? Exactly right. And yeah. as far as uh, the other issues, who takes up that discussion now? Is it the commissioners themselves that kind of hash out what conditions sh should be placed if they allow it? Yeah, basically what will happen is the chairman has asked the staff to draft an order. Um, and some say because he's going to approve this. Well, I, I, we have thought from the very beginning that the critical question, the binary question, do you allow the deal to move forward or do you try to block it, would be decided at the Department of Justice. There's never been a case where the Department of Justice has said yes and the FCC has said no. So we think there's very little risk that the, uh, the FCC says, well, the Department of Justice thought it was fine, but we think it's not fine. Rather, we think the debate will be about what conditions. But I would note that I think that the two Democratic commissioners have significant reservations about this deal and are, in my opinion, though I don't think they've made up their mind, uh, but, you know, predicting baseball seasons before spring training is e even over, um, no, I think th they're both likely to vote against it. Uh, even if, if the conditions they were looking for, like the, the least access and other things that are pet projects to them, were even attached to it? Well, that's the critical question. And I think that at the end of the day, it's unlikely that any condition is going to make this uh, deal palatable to them. But 
it could well be that there are conditions that they say, look, I, this isn't a great deal, but given that it's going to move forward, we're better off getting these conditions. Steve Perlstein, uh, the, the article we've talked about earlier, a uh, viewer, I think a, a, a emailer asked a question and said, but if, if the FCC does impose conditions, aren't you regulating a monopoly? And is that a concern, or even, even if that's an issue? Well, ag again, the monopoly is in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, there's no question that it's a monopoly in satellite radio, but, but so what? Is satellite radio a separate market? Um, and the Department of Justice has said, actually, it's not a separate market. Uh, and that's why they allowed the deal to go through. It is not true. I mean, the FCC has a lot of regulations that apply to lots of different folks who I don't think anyone thinks of as a monopoly. There are regulations that apply to broadcast television stations about certain forms that they must file certain educational television. There are regulations relating to the telephone companies, a lot of regulations relating to cable. Um, these are they are certainly uh, markets that are characterized by a small number of competitors. But whenever you have a situation where there's an enormous amount of capital that is required up front before you start making any money, it is very common for there to be a small number of competitors. It's not like um, a restaurant where there are thousands of different restaurants, thousands of different choices. Uh, you brought up a la carte, and just a quick thing about that. On this program, a lot, we hear differing opinions on a la carte, and right. whether it will save money, it gives more choice to the consumer. On a, on a satellite radio, does it work as a model uh, as it's presented, do you think? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, none of us can really know, right? right. I mean, uh, the, um, a as we say in the business that I'm in, if you really know something, it's not a stock, it's a bond, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a guarantee. The companies must believe that there is a good chance that it will succeed because they have essentially already offered to change their format to be an a la carte model. But it is not without risk. I mean, there are going to be lots of uh, consumers who say, hey, instead of paying twelve ninety five for everything, I'm going to pay six ninety five, buy the five channels at a quarter a piece that I, that I want, and my twelve ninety five that I'm paying the, them every, every month will go down to can't do the math that quick in my head, but eight bucks. So there's definitely risk there, but they think that you know it's 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 an acceptable risk. I may be wrong, but when the initial policy was drafted for spectrum radio, spec or satellite radio spectrum, was there a provision that wouldn't allow mergers? That's a, that's correct, uh, and I was actually chief of staff at that time. What the FCC policy said is that there will be two licenses. We will auction them off. There were four bidders for the two licenses. But that neither license, whoever won one license was not allowed to buy the other license. So the FCC wanted to make sure that there were at least two. But I would note to you that that was before there was any uh, iPod. And there are now, I think, more than 80 million iPods in the United States. Uh, and that more cars come with an iPod compatibility a jack, jack you can yeah. plug in, yeah. uh, then, then come with satellite radio. Uh, you know, it was before high definition radio started, which is going to double or triple the amount of different capacity on the free over the air radio. Um, so there are a lot of different uh, changes in the marketplace. I think the rule was certainly right in 1997 when we adopted it. Uh, the FCC will judge whether or not uh, it's, it's right today, but my my prediction is they will say that that rule is no longer necessary. Is there anybody out there that's contemplating a, another satellite network, or will we only see these two, do you think? Well, I think it depends on what you, what you mean by uh, another satellite network. Or a radio network such as XM Sirius. Well, I would argue that what Verizon and AT&T and Sprint are doing with music services that come through the cell phone is something similar. I mean, if you, can, if you have a lot of music on your cell phone or if you're getting a free service, um, you're, you know, you can bring that into the cars. And I think, you know, the 800-pound gorilla that is in the room, or I should say has not yet arrived in the room but is on its way, is Internet radio in the cars. Mm -hmm. There will be a moment, and I, I might note that the FCC just auctioned off a lot of the spectrum that could accelerate when that moment comes, when we essentially have mobile broadband everywhere. And so what people will be doing is they'll be paying a certain amount of money and the radios that you have 10 years from now will essentially pick up the internet and once you do that I mean there are certain complexities with it but you know there are services like Pandora or or other things that can give you all the music that you want essentially for free um, 
and what you're doing is you're paying for an internet connectivity in the car. So lots of different changes in the marketplace are out there in the future. Um, on a practical matter, if I was an investor looking at this potential merger, what questions am I asking about, you know, the, the questions that be, are being asked amongst new companies as far as how much staff is going to remain, where the buildings are going to reside, you know, who's going to be in charge of what? Yeah. Well, the question that investors were asking for a long time <laughs> since the merger was announced was, will the government approve this merger? You know, usually with mergers, people have a pretty good sense or a high level of certainty. Uh, the government's either going to approve it or, in the case of Echostar and DirecTV, um, reject it. In this case, it was interesting because uh, we were one of the few analysts who said at the beginning that we thought the government would approve this merger. Wall Street, for the first six months, really did not believe this merger would be approved. It wasn't until this summer, uh, or the last summer, I should say, that if you look at kind of the spread, which indicates the likelihood that this deal will go forward, that the spread started to reflect that Wall Street thought there was at least a 50% chance of it going through. So for a long time, there's been a big, big question mark. Would the government allow it to go through? I think that has now shifted, obviously, with the Department of Justice saying yes. Now what I think people are going to, you know, first question, what conditions are, is the FCC going to put on and what will that cost? But secondly, how do you actually make it work? How do you... What kind of services do you offer consumers? How do you make that transition from a different kind of set, two different satellite networks to a single satellite network? How do you work it with the actual radios in the car? What do you do about the old stuff? How do you do the programming? Who gets fired? Who stays? What happens when the contracts are up for renewal? Lots of different questions. If I'm, a, if I'm in terrestrial radio, as it's called, right. how am I looking at this? Well, it's interesting. The Truster Radio folks opposed it bitterly. They spent a huge amount of money, hired lots of lobbyists, hired not one but two former attorney generals to lobby the Department of Justice. Is this the National Association of Broadcasters? The National Association of Broadcasters, okay. which represents uh, the Truster Radio folks. So they, they spent a lot of money, um, uh, and they, they were making an argument that was very difficult to make, actually, because what they were saying was, Satellite radio competes with us, but we don't compete with them. That wasn't an argument that was likely to be welcomed by the DOJ. And the other thing was, when the DOJ looks at this, they're looking at uh, suppliers and distributors as a good proxy for whether there are, there's real benefit or whether there's anti-competitive harm. And if suppliers and distributors who ought to be hurt by any kind of merger say, well, actually there's some synergies and actually we're not hurt, they tend to go with the deal, and that's what happened here. On the other hand, if you look at potential competitors and they're opposed to the deal, the deal, DOJ is more likely to say, well, then it's probably good for competition. So the, the radio folks are obviously very, very concerned about this deal. They're going to go to the FCC. They're going to ask for a bunch of conditions. The biggest concern that they have is to make sure that satellite radio does not take away from their local advertising revenue. And there are various things they will ask for to make sure that that happens. And that's pretty much been the case so far. One of the issues they brought up in the press release that went out on this day the decision was made was they said that to hinge approval of this monopoly on XM and Sirius's refusal to deliver on a promise of interoperable radios is nothing short of breathtaking. Can you add some context? <laughs> well, when the FCC um, gave the licenses away or didn't, they sold them at the auction, there was a condition that the companies would develop an interoperable radio so that someone could have a single radio in their car and would then have the ability to switch. The companies actually, if, if I understand it correctly, did develop the technology to do that. But the, the problem was there was no one who wanted to subsidize that. The car companies didn't want to subsidize it. If you go to a car company, if you go buy a new car, um, the satellite radio folks will actually subsidize your purchase of a radio. So it wasn't quite clear where the financial incentives were for anyone to manufacture, distribute, sell, install these interoperable radios. Um, having said that, however, there is a little bit of, you know, no bad deed goes unrewarded, uh, if you will. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I agree with the broadcasters, but I think it is, a, and, and, and others have made that argument as well, that they're essentially being rewarded for not having lived up to the spirit of what the FCC wanted. Um, as far as supporters of this, even as opponents, could Congress step in and say, we have concerns about this, or have they pretty much already weighed in on this? Congress actually had four hearings on this, um, and they, they had concerns and they expressed them. 
Traditionally, Congress may weigh in with some concerns, but they do not act to block a specific merger. It's done. The Department of Justice has acted. Congress has had the hearings. Um, you know, various members of Congress, I suspect, will both write letters to the FCC and make phone calls to certain commissioners uh, to try to weigh in and try to get certain conditions. This is coming on the, at the same time that Clear Channel is having financial problems. Are there lessons to be learned as far as what's going on with XM Sirius and satellite radio and what's going on with Clear Channel and, and, and terrestrial radio? Are there comparisons, lessons to be learned, things to tie together between the two well, instances? Yeah, I, the, the Clear Channel problems actually are not so much the problems to me of, of the radio industry, though we'll chat about that. They have a very, they, they're trying to go private. They struck the deal before uh, the extent of the credit crisis was clear. And now lots of, as is true throughout the financial community, there are lots of um, threads that people are pulling at that just tend to rip up the whole cloth. And so their transaction to go private is under a lot of stress and may not occur. That's separate from the larger systemic, what you might think of as a secular trend, uh, which affects radio revenues. Radio has a single source of revenue, advertising. Some national, but mostly local advertising. Anyone uh, who's in the advertising business or the business of selling ads is affected by Google and the Internet and Yahoo and, every, and everybody else. Advertisers are moving there. It's more targeted. It's more focused. Um, you can track what happens better. So radio, television, satellite radio, these are all being affected uh, by that. And in addition, things like the iPod, um, things like music over cell phones, internet radio, these are all affecting radio too. So the, the great hopes that some people had uh, for satellite radio as being kind of a cable, I mean, c cable now is well, in what, or paid television is, you know, in more than 80% of American homes. There was a moment where you might have thought satellite radio would have been in that percentage of cars. I don't think anyone expects those kinds of numbers to be reached anymore. It's a bit dramatic, but is radio dying a slow death? Well, no, I don't think radio is dying. I think what you're talking about here, what are the margins, what are the profitability, what's the growth? Um, but look, 200, more than 200 million Americans every day listen to radio. It's going to be, if it's dying a slow death, it's a very slow death. Um, you know, my children are still going to listen to radio in the cars. My grandchildren, I suspect, will listen to radio in the cars. It's a, it's a long time before we really do a total transition to some other medium like Internet radio. How does, I guess, from your experience at the FCC and, and outside of it, when, when you look at these industries and they change so rapidly, how do you keep up regula on, on a regulatory basis with that? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, the Communications Act was signed in 1996. Right. Uh, I think went through a, a revamp, or if, if I'm correct, but how do you keep up with the trends as far as regulatory issues are concerned? Oh, oh, well, it helps. In my particular case, it helps to have been there when a lot of these issues uh, were being discussed. Um, when the, the chairman designee, Reed Hunt, uh, asked me to be his chief of staff, I remember telling him I, I didn't really know. I, I'd been a corporate lawyer for some communications firms, but didn't know that much about the regulatory part. And he said, oh, don't worry, we're, we're rewriting everything anyway. Um, he was kidding, but in some sense, when I got to the FCC, you know, there was no Internet. There were only two wireless companies. Uh, the lanes of the information highway were not that vibrant. By the time we left, uh, there was a lot of different activity going on. So a lot of the issues that were raised in the discussions about the 1996 Act, um, they keep coming up. And so it's easier for me to follow than I think for other folks because I have a certain kind of familiarity with it. But, it, you know, you're absolutely right. There are just many, many different kinds of uh, activities going on. And it's fascinating, for example, in the, in the last auction to see that um, in a lot of ways it was seen as an auction in the terms of the policy of Google versus the incumbent wireless companies. Mm -hmm. Now, Google is not a wireless company, but they obviously have a lot of interest in how the wireless Internet develops. And so you start to see lots of different companies uh, care in ways that were not true when I was at the FCC about what the policies are. Assuming that Chairman Martin does leave after this year, being uh, being a last year for him, if if when the transition of uh, presidential power changes, um, what's next? I guess as far as the person who's going to take that seat, what kind of issues is he going to have to face? Well, the next chairman of the FCC. First of all, if, if McCain is elected, um, you, you could see Kevin actually sticking around for some time. I. I 
Uh, Chairman Martin and Senator McCain have a good relationship. They agree very much on a la carte uh, for cable. They co-authored an editorial together. Um, they, they know each other well. Though, eventually, at some point in time, McCain will certainly pick his own person to be chair. The, the first task for the FCC um, next year will be to clean up whatever mess remains from the digital television transition. This is an extraordinary moment um, in which a lot, millions of Americans are going to lose to TV service. There will be lots of warnings. There will be lots of, uh, in the fall and pre-Christmas, there will be lots of ads saying, buy a TV set to make sure you can get the signal. But nonetheless, it is inevitable that there will be a moment of disruption, and dealing with that will be very significant. Then there are a series of other issues that I think folks are going to have to look at. Um, you know, the net neutrality issue that's being discussed now will certainly be uh, coming back. There'll be certainly be some more mergers. I think for I, I think one issue that uh, may come up even before then, um, because of currency issues, we're going to see more foreign investment into some of our telecom and media companies. And there's always been a concern about foreign investment in those kinds of companies in a way that you don't really care if a, um, a sovereign wealth fund is investing in, you know, a McDonald's. Um, so uh, lots of different issues uh, f facing the next chair. There have been stories uh -huh. that say that uh -huh. if a Democratic president does come in, that you'll be the next chairman of the FCC, or at least a potential candidate. <laughs> is that true? Uh, first of all, there are lots of um, potential candidates. Uh, secondly, I, I know from my experience in watching this that a, a lot of those stories are very speculative, and the, the person who actually gets named is not necessarily that. Um, uh, Can I ask you if you've at least been approached on this proposition? N n n no, absolutely not. <laughs> Other than by reporters, no. Uh, I have um, I've had the good pleasure of working with lots of folks who I think would be fine candidates. Um, I, I'm associated with the Obama campaign, and it's interesting, a lot of the people that I work with at the FCC are associated with that campaign, um, and, and a number of them would be terrific as chair. Uh, there are a couple of people over in the Clinton campaign who I also know very well. Uh, they'd be great, too. So, and, to and, and actually, you know, I, I actually know the McCain people pretty well. Uh, you know, my, my preference for a, a Democrat, it's not really because of the telecom issues. There are a bunch of other issues. Uh, but I, I think that whoever is chair, you're going to face a very different picture than what we were looking at when I was there and what uh, Reed Hunt's pre uh, successor, Bill Kennard, was looking at. Very different kinds of markets. There's been a lot more consolidation. Um, the wireless industry is moving in, in certain different kinds of directions. Uh, you've had tremendous vertical integration as well. There are some things that are going, I think, very well. There are some things that are very troubling. Uh, I think that whoever uh, is elected is going to have to look more seriously at um, the broadband picture in America. And, and I don't want uh, to necessarily be critical of what has happened, except to say that in some areas it's not working so well. And I think most people would, would agree with that, in some areas. And the question is identify those areas, identify targeted focus solutions, and, and let's try to make sure that uh, all America is connected, not just to low-grade broadband, but to big broadband. Blair, Le Blair Levin uh, with uh, Stiefel Nicholas here in Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us on The Communicators. Thank you very much.